Welcome to Season 1, Episode 5 of the All Unknowing Podcast. This episode is Part 1 of a two-part special in which Daniel and Peter discuss cancel culture and the impact that it is having on our society. Now join us as we jump into the unknown. So I, I think in this episode, we really want to focus on the whole premise of, of cancel culture. And I think we probably start by defining what we perceive it to be, because it, it certainly in my eyes, a significant problem that, that I think we need to start talking about and trying to solve. When I look at cancel culture as a whole, we hear about it in the media, we see it in the media, right? We're doing, it's been around for at least a decade, and at least for the masses to view. And when, when I see it happening, you know, we saw it with that, the, the conversation that we had about the university professor a few weeks ago, it's permeated every level of, of, of society, every vertical, every industry that education and professional life. But ultimately, I, I think it just comes down to if, if you have people that are following a certain viewpoint, the ideology or whatever it may be, and, and someone differs from that opinion in the slightest way, that you could find any excuse or reason to vilify them for whatever it may be. And again, this is typically, it's an attack on a person. It's not an attack on an actual idea or a thought. And that is the biggest problem because we might have a differing of opinion, but if we don't have these types of conversations to understand why we have a differing of opinion and what we can do about that and what the best path forward is, then we're moving towards that totalitarian viewpoint. And that's what we're seeing permeate through every level of society here. Yeah. And I agree. And I think inadvertently, the people who are doing this are creating the next generation of extremists. Mm -hmm. Because when you think about the perception of cancel culture of somebody who isn't terribly inclined to think deeply, which let's be honest, it's a lot of people, right? Right. If they see that somebody's getting shouted down, the instant reaction is, wait a minute, why are they not letting this guy speak? He must be on to something. Maybe I should be listening to what this guy says and not the other people say. Fundamentally, that's demagoguery. That is the core reality, the seed, the genesis of every catastrophic social political change that's happened in the last 150 years that inevitably ends up leading to a lot of violence and bloodshed. I think what we have to really grab a hold of and return is true freedom of speech. And I'm looking squarely at academia and tertiary education in the United States for this. I don't know if it's as bad in other countries around the world, but I can tell you the difference in what passes for intellectual debate in college campuses in 2021 is not what it was for me 30 years ago as a college freshman. We could pretty much talk about anything and maybe people thought you were stupid, maybe thought you you were logical in your arguments, maybe thought you had some points but were invalid in others. The, The essence of the argument being that At least people would have the discussion in a rational manner, more or less. It's the ad hominem attacks and the blatant, irrational attitudes of those who are making these ad hominem attacks have destroyed any semblance of civil discourse to the long-term detriment of the country. And it definitely is to the detriment of the country. And I want to highlight that for a second, right? Because when we have a holistic viewpoint, a totalitarian viewpoint, is a better way to say that. And I keep hitting on that word. And and really what I'm saying is that we're following one way of thinking so that if the mass has accepted that and we're not paying attention to those nuances, and I can go back 20 years ago when I was a university freshman, I had a economics professor who referred to CNN as the communist news network. Right. Right. And I asked him after class why, but he actually explained to me his reasonings for that. And while I didn't wholly agree with them, he certainly was able to express that and I was able to question it and there was no harm, no foul. And then plenty of other debate happened in that class. But we can't always think that we are right in what we're thinking. That's really the chief reason why we started this podcast, because I think it's through these thought exercises that we come to realize perhaps a better way, right? I can tell you for a fact that if we don't let people speak and we don't let the minority voices be heard, we already know how things are going now. We can see where the trends are going. And anybody who is paying the least bit of attention and has any kind of foresight sees where this is going to end up. So there's a history books filled with that too. So and I think 
I think that's a very key point. When we look at what has the trend been in teaching the young adults of, of the country how to think, it hasn't been, as we talked about earlier, synthesis right. of different ideas to come in, right? It's a reductionist argument where we have to deconstruct everything into a very simple form and to theoretically get at the essence of whatever that thing is. That's ludicrous. Things cannot be ultimately deconstructed into simple forms. The human being, the human mind is not a simple thing. It's a complex thing. Multiple human minds that interact to form multiple human societies are very, very complex. There's history, there's culture, there's religion, there's economics, there's geography, there's geology, there's biology, there's agriculture. All of these things play into what defines a culture and the interplay of cultures, right? Right. So anybody who wants to go ahead and espouse a multicultural viewpoint, that's fine. And there's probably a lot of merit to it, but you don't achieve a better multicultural understanding by attacking and discarding elements of a culture with which you disagree. It has to be a more thoughtful, nuanced, and intelligent discussion of the benefits, the the consequences, the pros, the cons, whatever, of a given issue that we're discussing. And I think it's interesting to say, okay, if this deconstructionist approach has been the dominant theory, and I I mean, again, we're talking humanities, right? Right. I'm sure. sure. Yeah, science. uh, It's more empirical, right? Yeah. Right. So it, it, it's an entirely different discussion. But no, I, I think in some ways that's been attacked as well, but it, it, it certainly holds way less merit. Yeah, because in spite of arguments to the contrary, two plus two always equals four. Sorry. Right. right? And if you can learn scientific principles, laws, equations, they work no matter who does them in what culture at what time or, or what have you. Right. Uh, that why, that That's why it's science. It's not art. It's not opinion. So different sphere, I think. As yeah, as and, and I think wholly, this has become a, it's a symptom to me of poor leadership at the highest levels down to every, every subordinate level. And, and, and I'm not saying that everywhere that exists, there's poor leadership, but I think ultimately there's a disconnect between our ability to be unified as a populace here towards a common good, towards a common goal. Is, is, the, is the fundamental underlying deficiency. And I think that every leader who's had a chance to do that has certainly squandered it in recent history. So probably the most important aspect of this to discuss, why, 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 right? This has to be the core question that everybody asks about everything. So if we have this poor leadership, why do we have it? They're getting bad advice. Okay, why are they getting bad advice? They're getting bad advice from picking and choosing academic studies to support, bolster a given argument. Because it's, it's cognitive bias, right? but it's happening at the highest level. So, okay, we, if we acknowledge that there is a cognitive bias, who is forming this cognitive bias and why? And this is where we have to trace the money trail and all these things, right? This is coming from academia, from very specific schools with professors that are getting grant money. Who's giving them the grant money to do these studies? Who's publishing their work? And on those entities, the bodies, the journals, the the institutions that publish said work, who funds them? And why are they publishing this work and not another? Or are they? Are they publishing a spectrum and somebody is only picking and choosing a very narrow band of that spectrum to promulgate certain ideas and to promote agendas? Uh, Nobody ever goes back to question raw data because the academia has degenerated into publishing and republishing stuff that's already been said a million times, a million different ways with no new knowledge added on to it. At least humanities, again, not talking STEM, right? Right. If you're regurgitating this stuff and, and I'm lumping political science and all the related surveying public opinion methodologies and all that, there's a huge amount of subjective rules upon which these disciplines are based. And I don't think people appreciate that because when they see something like a poll of 500 Americans finds X, Y, and Z, that's irrelevant. 500 Americans don't vote. 
and 500 is a meaningless sample number, right? Any sure, statistician sure. will tell you that. If you start saying things like, well, we conducted a poll of 50,000 registered voters evenly split among the main political parties. We asked them these questions and we evenly distributed it across all the United States. So of those 50,000, we had a thousand per state. Now that's a different level of discourse because there's certain barriers uh, that have been overcome because of how the study was structured. Now you look at the questions, you see how were the questions worded, so on and so forth. And then we publish our findings and we extrapolate certain theses based on what the data in the survey showed us. That is good social science. That is good polling. That is good political science. How often is that done versus a poll of 500 people on the evening news told us this? Right. How, right. how much more easily can one be manipulated versus the other? And, and you can use that type of analysis to bolster an argument in any way, shape, or form, right? It's like, exactly. it's no different than the propaganda conversation we touched on briefly in a previous episode, but where they were well, doing uh, the, the newspaper aside, headings. I think right? one of the most formative books I ever read, very, very small. I don't think it was more than perhaps 120 pages. Okay. And it's called How to Lie with Statistics. And if memory serves, that came out somewhere in the 60s, something like that. So this is not a new book. It's been around forever. And it shows by cherry picking statistics, by cherry picking how you display the results of those statistics with, for example, uh, bar charts versus pie charts, right. trend lines and all that sort of thing, messing with the scale of the trend lines, either on the X or the Y axis. You get completely different interpretations by someone who casually looks at the artifacts of a study without understanding the underlying data or seeing how certain things were manipulated. That was mandatory reading on, believe it or not, my high school biology class, uh, because the most excellent teacher I ever had, Robert Akison, told us that, hey, this is how I'm going to know if you guys dummy up data in your lab assignments. So don't dummy up data in your lab assignments. Read this book. <laughs> best book I ever read. <laughs> no, no, that, that's very interesting. I, 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 I like that. And I like that the teacher at that level was able to push you too, that they weren't, um, they weren't holding back. You know what I mean? And I, I think part of that's so, from experience. There was no expectation of mediocrity. Right. It was an expectation of excellence. And hey, if you're going to put one over on me, you better be damn good because I've read this book and many more beyond it. So I know all the tricks you yeah, sneaky yeah, yeah, little teenagers. You know what to look for, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, are we doing that for the average person? No. And, and yeah. I think th there, there's a few things that we've pulled out here that I want to touch on. So from a social science perspective, you got to yeah. think about to do it the right way. Let's say that all things are aside and we don't even have a bias, but to do it the right way to understand is going to cost a lot of money. Ah, right. Point. Yeah. So how would we get past that? It's almost like we would need a, and I, I think I'm going to, I'm just going to throw this out here. So what we need is a bit of political reform in the United States. I think that's what we need. And it needs to happen in, in many different ways. And this is not the episode for that. But I would categorize that type of analysis as being apolitical, okay? And the use of it to inform policy, you know, we live in the information age, really the misinformation age. So let's try to align that back towards information that we can actually use in a tangible way. So I, I've already noted that down. I would very much like to talk about that specifically in the future. But that aside... A lot of this comes back to from a psychological perspective, okay? The what and the how wiring in the head in each of our brains in the human mind, okay? It's different. So it's easy for you to look at a statistical chart and see what you're looking at. It's easy for you to hear an argument about cancel culture or see a news article and understand what is being conveyed. What is the problem, right? What is yeah. the accusation? Very easy to d disseminate. We do that all day. That's why reality TV shows are so popular. Okay. Mm. It's the what. The, the how is much more complex. It's a completely separate neural pathway. Yeah. All right. And to develop that goes back to some of the things we've been talking about throughout the series, right? It, it's teaching the critical thinking. It's it, holding high standards to the individual level. Not the same standard for everybody, but l l let's be the best that we can be, right? Yeah. Well, let's pull everybody up to be the best that we can be. And let's think for ourselves. We have to be free thinkers. That's the only way that, that our republic and democratic system can work, okay? Mm -hmm. 
if, if we have the right to do whatever we, we see fit, ultimately, we have these freedoms. Our biggest downfall is misinformation, our, ultimately. Yeah, right? and, and, and this is why this entire trend, it's absolutely accelerated the last, like you said, 10 years for sure, five or six, 100%, right? We're very much turning into a 21st century tribal society because of this, Yes, where it's my tribe against your tribe. And it's really ending up turning into a class warfare that's getting manipulated or, or manifested in uh, post-secondary education. Uh, like the example I use a lot that I think is relevant is whenever we have any kind of public discussion, you always talk about the working class and this, that, or the other. Nobody right. actually wants to define what working class is. All right. I'm going to throw in all skilled tradesmen, plumbers, okay. welders, carpenters, electricians, right? The guys that actually, and gals that, that build stuff, right? There's a tendency among certain academic snobs that I've run across professionally that tend to be involved in various policy think tanks to dismiss this very big segment of our population, of our you know brothers and sisters in the country as being easily manipulated and ill-educated and, hey, they didn't go to college. What do they know? Well, it always struck me kind of funny that they didn't go to college always enters into the debate as if going to college is a, a prerequisite to understand what's going on around you and a prerequisite to see, hear, listen, talk, and form your own opinion. It's nice. You're absolutely exposed to a lot of ideas that you may or may not have been exposed to otherwise, but it's not mandatory for somebody to be thoughtful and to pay a lot of attention to what's going on around them, right? Well, where does this resentment come from? And again, this is the economics of it and how we've absolutely skewed what uh, a college education means. What I think, where I think it boils down to is they're seeing an electrician at 22 years of age, no debt, making great money, and already starting off on a pretty successful economic path, assuming he doesn't screw it up, versus the 22-year-old poli-sci major sitting in a cube farm somewhere with 250000 in debt because they bought the lie that they would have to go to a quote unquote good school at 60,000 a year to get a, a good paying job. And they bought the whole lie that, Hey, you're smarter because you've done this. Why am I not making more than this dusty guy that just ran electrical cable for me? It's pretty brutal and ugly class warfare that gets manifested in those kinds of discussions. And I've had them, or I've heard people talking about them because I don't subscribe to that at all. Right. Um, my opinion is, you know, everybody has their own gifts and talents. Everybody contributes equally. Everybody can contribute intellectually. Just they might not agree with you, man. And you, you better accept that. Well, you, you have to. You have to you be interact. Yeah, you, you have to be willing to take the advantage point that may not be your own. Yeah. And but I think that that's one thing that I've always been able to do fairly well. And I, I don't know for other people what the difference is. You know, if, if I, I'll give you an example. I'll take a competing theory and I'll put it in my head as if I am living that theory, right? And I act that out like mentally. I will go through the entire process, however long it takes. And then I can, you know, you kind of rank order things. Okay, yeah, that would work in these scenarios, but it doesn't work in the rest of these scenarios. So it doesn't really mesh well with the complete big picture, but that doesn't mean that maybe this particular element of it is, is within reason and actually mm -hmm. maybe better than some other ways that we were viewing it. So you could see and appreciate perhaps what they're doing. But I think when you're doing something from, you know, we, we talked about pride the other day, right? I mean, how many yeah. different uh, interpretations of pride are there in the English language? When you're doing something from, a, from an arrogance perspective, when you, yeah. you, you, you shouldn't look down on, on, on someone else. And ultimately, because we're all human beings. And what I would always like to say, we're, we're probably all a handful of um, decisions away from being uh, homeless or borderline. And percent. <laughs> we're all, it doesn't matter if you're educated or not, yeah. you know, you, you might be more likely statistically not to be because you put yourself in some particular situation or another, but at the end of the day, we're all contributing to this puzzle here. Right. And then, then, so. I think there's a certain lack of perspective too, with all of these very ardent supporters of cancel culture. I would really like to know how much of the world have these people seen? Yeah. And I mean, truly the world, not 
going on a, a really nice vacation to Cancun or Provence or something like that, right? Have you seen really terrible parts of the world? Have you seen really poor parts of the world that yeah. maybe aren't terrible, but they're just poor? Have you seen poor parts of the country outside of you know your own trailer that drives whatever agenda you might have? Interestingly enough, it's been my experience that some of the most astute observers are human nature mm. are the proverbial farm boys that joined the military and did multiple tours of duty overseas. Yeah. Because, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll look at these guys and it's clear, you know, this dude is not a hefty intellectual smart guy, but, you know, he's not going to talk about Descartes, you know, versus Kant or anything. Right. Mm, right. But when you start talking about day to day, I'm sorry. I said Kant loses, by the way. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, me too. But, uh, but when you talk about day-to-day experiences and the practical matter of living and getting along with other people, they have extremely astute observations of human nature because uh, the, the nature of being in the military forces you to like it or not to get along with yeah. whoever is your unit, your commanding officer, or whatever. You may not like it but you got to do it because everybody else is doing it. You can it. work together towards a common objective. Exactly, right? right? And then when they go over to, you know, some of the miserable wars that this country seems to perpetually get involved in, they have a much more nuanced understanding of what's going on over there with the people than the other spe- end of the spectrum back home who wants to promote one agenda or another. I think Living an experience gives you an appreciation of walking another mile, of walking a mile in another person's shoes. And I think too many of these very vocal cancel culture proponents, the ones who are charging comics on the stage because they don't like the jokes that they make, you know, they lack that perspective because yeah. at the end of the day, they're entitled overgrown man children. And this is the the, the crux where I think too many people are spoiled and they don't appreciate the vast, vast, vast complexity of what any culture has to offer within itself, much yeah. less when you start talking about other places too. Yeah, I've absolutely enjoyed traveling the world and I've been many, yeah. many, many places. And I can think of some small hole in the wall places where you'd meet, you'd meet the friendliest people in the world. Yeah. And they might even, they, I may not even speak their language, but we can still communicate on the basis of being civil human beings. And yeah. it, 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 sometimes we have translators, sometimes we don't. But I, I'd always, I, 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 I look back in, in several places and I've seen some very destitute things in my life. It, it's very, it, 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 it really pulled me in a particular way. I was in business for a long time and just being exposed to, certain scenarios and situations and really sitting there and reflecting on what it is that, that, that we do versus what it is that some other group or culture or whatever it may be are doing. And the fact that these people live in a certain way and here they are living, you know, I, I wonder if, if, if they don't live a, a truer life than, than some people here, but well, even within the borders of the U S true. Right? So you've lived in Alabama, you've lived in Texas. Yeah. What would you say the proverbial coastal elites could learn from going to, you know, somewhere deep in, in the Alabama woods. And I, I think that we always fostered a sense of appreciation for life, for what it was. So the, I think the common perception, of the South is that it's just, it's slower paced. Everybody there is slow, right? Not, not really the case. I'm from the South. Okay. I'm definitely not slow, but can I appreciate that? Yes, I appreciate it because they have a certain perspective on life, what's valuable. And I, I think ultimately what's valuable to them and that most people that live there can agree on that. And you know what? That's why they stay unified in that way. And it's certainly an appealing place for, for those reasons. There are plenty of things that I love about you know, the Bostons, the New Yorks, the, the Milwaukees and everywhere else. It's not to say that there aren't that the people are better inherently because they live in the South. That's not what I'm saying whatsoever. But from a perspective of focus on maybe more on life, more values, values. It, diff, different priorities. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And th- th- there's a balance there. I think if you have a shift one side uh, to too much one side or the other, right? Th- there is that. But I still have a lot of friends there, for sure. So, and I'm uh, grateful for the time that I was able to live there. So having spent a little time, right, myself around Huntsville, yeah. both before and after, we got to know each other. Right. 
I will say one thing that always struck me south, and ironically, on the other side of the country, Idaho, for the same thing, is how cordial and polite people are. Oh, yeah. Uh, Idaho, props to the Idaho people. I was suspicious because you know, I was still in East Coast mentality. And they're right. so nice. And I thought they were running scams on me until <laughs> a friend of mine essentially slapped me in the head and said, no, you idiot. They really are nice up here. <laughs> <Calm down. laughs> yeah. That's what my wife has made that observation as well. She lived in Alabama for a little bit and yeah. she was like, she, she was like, I would move back there any time, you know, any, any time. Well, you know? where, where I go with this is, can you imagine anybody in Alabama, Louisiana, Texas and, you know, Idaho, since I gave him the props. Sure. Can you imagine these people getting up out of their chairs and screaming down somebody just because they had a different opinion? I mean, yeah, I can imagine if they were espousing something completely abhorrent to human nature. Yeah, of course, they'd stand up and, and say something. But just in, in the course, well, you know, hey, son, if, if you don't like the guy's jokes, don't go to his show. It's that 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 would certainly be the feedback I received. Yeah. um, Yeah. Or that I would have received, I should say. And I think that it's just it's it's probably a more reasonable approach in the sense that we live in a country where people are allowed to say things. You may or may not agree with those things. If you don't agree with them, go your own way. Yeah. Nobody's forcing you to listen. Yeah. yeah, No one's forcing you. Yeah. And I I think that we have to remember that too. And I think that gets lost, right? But I, you know. Back to one of the other points that you had made, Peter, was, you know, we find ourselves here in, in really 21st century tribalism, where it's an us, it's an us first them mentality. And if you have a differing viewpoint, you're not with us. And if you're not with us, get canceled, right? So that doesn't really help us get anywhere, right? Because all you're doing is you're taking people who want to be willing participants of a system. And, and this could be on the left. It could be on the right. It could be anywhere. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And I want to be, I want to be abundantly clear with that. This isn't a liberal versus conservative problem. This is a United States and probably to a degree, the, the Western world problem. And we have to get out of that mindset because we are great as a country because we have so many different opinions, because we have so many different thoughts, because we have so many different uh, people from different backgrounds and capabilities. Yeah. We need to let that funnel up to the top. We need to do it in an intelligent way. And if we don't, then we all end up living... Yeah like everybody used to live in Africa many, 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 many years ago. Right. So that actually left them vulnerable because when the colon, the colonial powers came in, what do they do? Divide and conquer because yeah, easily, because it's like one, one group versus the other and then one, one tribe versus the other. And then you, I don't know how many people here have, that are listening have traveled to central Africa perhaps, but there are still some places there that are very, very much, all us first them. I mean, uh, anybody who's been to Rwanda in the last 20 years, you know, yeah. like more bordering countries, it's not exactly a lovely place. And it's because of that mode of thinking that we can't separate it. And, you know, part of it's like, man, it, it really, I, I think it's a sad since story. you brought it up, I think I put it on our book list. Yeah, you did. You did. It's a fantastic. It's, it's absolutely. Yeah. I, I really urge everybody to, because Daniel and I have talked about this off camera. I, I urge everybody to go and get that book from Amazon. Because it shows how easily people can be manipulated by agendas to go to something that to do stuff that's against their nature. Rwanda was not at all in the 60s and early 70s, the brutal tribal warfare wasteland that it turned into in the 90s. That was engineered over a period of time yes. by propaganda and strong arm warlords. It's just a horrible situation, but it was created by people with evil intent for their own purposes. This wasn't a ground up, bottom up type of uh, uh, movement. No. And at the end, uh, you know, how many people died? Who knows? A million? Maybe more. Probably right? more. For no reason other than one was Tutsi and one was Hutu, who historically got along just fine with plenty of intermarriage and all this other type of stuff. So, you know, the point is, if it can happen in Central Africa in the 21st century, it can happen anywhere. Well, yeah. And, this is what we have to safeguard against in, in all of our cultures where, OK, you don't like somebody for whatever reason, socioeconomic, political, religious, what have you. Fine. Why don't you be the best that you can do uh, or be? And if you, in fact, have a worthy world viewpoint, other people will flock to you yeah. and you will have a vibrant community built on positivity, 
we're saying, hey, yeah, look, we, we think we got to figure it out. This is pretty cool. You want to hang with us? You know, this is what to expect versus we're taking out those other guys because they're saying stuff that's wrong. OK, let them say stuff that's wrong. But if you define you have wrong. wrong, right. And let them, you know, try and attract people. And if they are objectively morally repugnant, guess what? They're not going to attract a lot of people because nobody's going to want to be around them. Well, people by nature want to be around positive, uplifting, supportive environments. The only time they're attracted to the negative is because they themselves have lost hope and it can't be made to see that there are other things in life beyond the, their immediate complaints or, or what have you. I think that one thing to remember from this sense of tribalism is that we are all, no one is immune. Yeah. And in, in as much as, as they aren't paying attention. Okay. So everybody has potential. What, what the, in what manner will that potential manifest itself over time? Well, one day it might be defined as good, another day is evil, right? Who knows? It depends on what value you're, you're, you're aiming at. And I don't mean to be completely abstract here, but what I'm trying to say is that you have to identify that you have potential, hmm. okay? And if you have potential, then in which way are you going to orient yourself? Are you going to orient yourself towards objective truth and trying to uncover what that is, at least what trying to go down that path? Or are you going to consume the propaganda, in this case, the cancel culture here? and to become a member of a tribe. Yeah. So, okay, what's objective truth? Deconstructionists would argue there is none, that everything's relative based on your particular point in time, human experience, et cetera. I argue that's a, that's a specious reasoning. It that is. Anything that is objectively tr good is that which uplifts, builds, supports, and c creates an environment where people can flourish. Now, whether that's economic, and not necessarily. There have been plenty of poor cultures that had very rich cultures in right. terms of interpersonal relationships, familial relationships, uh, what have you. That is an objective good. Now, does that mean it's Indian Hindu culture throughout the years? Does it mean, is it Japanese Shinto culture? Does it mean it's both? I don't know. You know, that, that's not for me to say, but both of those cultures have been around for a really, really long time. So a lot of people have found a lot of good in them. Why shouldn't we support them and everybody else who wants to do something like that? You know, on the opposite side, you look at all the totalitarian governments that have come and gone in the last hundred years, whether you're talking Stalin, whether you're talking Khmer Rouge, whether you're talking, you know, Nazi Germany, what have you. None of those cultures engendered support, uplift, flourishing, growth, right. harmony. It was all, I'm the boss, I'm the new warlord. I'm going to tell all you guys how it's going to be. If you don't like it too bad, if your life sucks, it's not because you made a lot of poor decisions. It's not because other people have made crappy decisions and tanked our economy and our society, what have you. It's because those people are, are the problem and fill in who those people are. That yeah, that's uh, us first them, externalization of the, of the problem. Right. right. So we, now the, the tribalism comes in because somebody is fermented divisions based on fictitious grievances or historical wrongs in the whole thing. You make a fantastic point there. From a deconstructionist perspective, I think you can deconstruct anything as much as you want. That doesn't mean that it's a meaningful analysis of the situation, because ultimately we are all alive here and right now. And it, if you can't objectively discern what that path is that is more meaningful, hmm. that is more fruitful, that you can't actually say that it's better if we live in harmony and we can all accept a, an approach towards an objective truth in general. I'm not saying what truth is because it's to some degree subjective, but that we can all agree in that common direction along that thread that we're all tracking in a unified way, at least that we'll call something out if it seems false. I mean, if, if you put on your favorite song on the radio and you look at the, the feed on the radio and it says, you know, favorite song by XYZ. And suddenly it's completely not, it's out of tune and it's completely wrong. Mm. It's the wrong song. Will you not immediately notice that? Yeah. Right? Of course it's you will. It's disharmonious. It's disharmonious or it's deceitful. You know, one of yeah. the two. And you, you could immediately, what's going on? What is the radio station doing here? You know, what are, are they trolling me? Or, you know, like, or am I wrong? You know what I mean? Like, have I been lied to this whole time? You know, probably it's not that. Probably you know what you're, what, probably you know what you're thinking. Probably you know what to expect. And there's a deficiency between you and the person who's playing that song. 
but you could objectively understand in this scenario that, hey, that's wrong. I know that this is true. And I'm going to go back and, and stop listening to this radio station because they play stuff that's completely crazy. It's not even, right. it's not real, you know? And, so and let's I go. Think, I think it's an interesting analogy because music pretty much more than anything is a matter of taste, right? Sure. So a disingenuous argument is that all of the morality essentially is a matter of taste. And I disagree with that. Morality is objective uh, at a certain level where pretty much if you go anywhere in the world and ask people about certain things, are these good for your society or bad for your society? More often than not, I would say almost everybody is going to agree that certain things are almost always bad and certain things are almost always good. So there is an objective truth to whatever morality you want to discuss that doesn't, that transcends time, place, language, religion, the whole bit. Yes. You know, should you be allowed to go and randomly kill people on the streets? No. Show me the culture where that has ever been accepted. So that is accepted as a universal evil that cannot be tolerated, right? It's not even accepted within animal kingdoms. Exactly, right? Because in, even in the animal kingdoms, if that happens, the rest will turn on the offender and, and off you go. Correct. And I think that is kind of where a, a lot of the negativity in the cancel culture comes from because they ignore reality, right? And they ignore that there is a reality of certain objective truths, which you may or may not agree with, but that's the way they are. If you don't like it, well, how about you do something constructive to try and change it and win people to your side, to your argument versus attacking somebody because you don't like the joke that they say, right? Or, or you know, the colleges making the students making the colleges disinvite certain unfavored people from commencement speaking. addresses or yeah, yeah, yeah. speaking yeah. engagements or what have you, yeah. right? You know, really? Uh, so you you want to set yourself up as bastions of intellectualism, of thoughtful consideration of various uh, viewpoints, of discussion, a free flow of ideas, right? My favorite phrase. And yet you won't allow somebody because a very small amount of your student body wants to sit, stand up like petulant little t- tyrannical toddlers, hold their breath, stomp their feet and wave their hands and say, no, nah, I don't like him. Okay, you don't have to go. It, That's right. Have a counter argument. Have somebody come up and debate the person. And instead, no, we're just going to make sure he never shows up to begin with. I think it's stemming from a very small percentage of, of, of the group who will, will start that type of a cancel movement. Yeah. And at least the ones that I have seen in the media. And you, you know, you, you spend a little time to dig into it and you, and you wonder, like, how many people does it take to get someone canceled? You know? Well, <laughs> I don't even think it takes a lot. I think it just I don't takes think it does loud, loud people. The well, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. What do I think that typically the people who are yelling the loudest get yeah. the attention? Because it's like, why are they yelling? There must be something wrong, right? I think that's part of I think there, it, it plays on human nature again, but because really. It, it's toddlers having a tantrum because they're screaming like a two-year-old will. And everybody else on the plane is just like, lady, will you shut that kid up? You know, we've been on the plane for three hours. I just want to get over to Boise. Let's go. And I, I think th- this is what's missed. Yeah, the, the, um, the, 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 your volume does not win an argument. The strength of your arguments will win at the debate. It will, and and we have to, again, being a free society, we have to have these debates. Otherwise, yeah. we, otherwise, it's unsustainable. It's it's the greatest threat. And if we have a very small percentage of the population that's able to cancel people with poor ideas, I mean, I, I'll throw something out there here, right? Like, and I I, I, I want to be like crystal clear. If someone goes to court and they're a convicted sex offender. And you don't want them working at your place of employment anymore because there's children around? Yeah, that's yeah. just logical. That's not that we don't need to cancel that person. Right? Like that's just a reasonable and, act. And, 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 yeah. Okay. So ignoring reality, people right. like that aren't right. They're never going to be right. I don't want them associated with my business because I spent my entire life building this, and everybody here has families. So I should be allowed to say no. Hit the road. Right. right. Go find somewhere else. But now somebody will scream, you're infringing on his rights. Screw his rights. What about my rights? What about the rights of everybody else that associates with me to not be subjected to somebody who will never be right and who's actively committed evil? Because don't tell me this is accepted anywhere in human society. It's not. 
No, it, it can't because it's not sustainable, right? Yeah. It's, it's the thing which consumes itself. We hope you have enjoyed this episode. Subscribe now to be notified of future episodes and check out our website at theallunknowing.com. Thank you.